Um, so first of all, thanks for inviting me here. So this is my first time at Waterloo. It's been wonderful so far. And I must say I'm really impressed with the navigational skills of the people here. Um, so I'm going to talk about graph routing problems, about approximation and harness uh, of approximation. And I'll touch a little bit about related graph theoretic notions. So uh, suppose you want to close some streets in your city for construction and you want to set up detours, but you don't want to congest other roads too much. Or maybe you want to design a really side ship and you need to figure out how to lay down the wires. Or maybe you have a bunch of robots that you want to move across the soccer field so they don't bump into each other. Or maybe you have an optical network and you want to figure out how to route traffic there. So in all of these cases, you'll be solving a graph routing problem. So in general, in graph routing problems, you want to move stuff across the graph. So probably most of you are familiar with the maximum ST flow problem, which is a very famous and classical graph routing problem. And then there is a multi commodity flow problem, which is like the ST flow problem, only you have several such ST flows in your graph simultaneously. So the problem I'll be talking about today mostly uh, called no digit path problem. So you can think about it as multi commodity flow problem, only integral version of it, but I'm going to define it. So what's a no digit path problem? So you have a graph, and in this graph you have pairs of vertices, S1, T1, S2, T2 through SK, TK. So we call them source destination or demand pairs. These are pairs of vertices that want to talk to each other. So I want to route them, as many of them as possible. Where to route a pair, I need to choose a path connecting that pair. And I require that the routing is done on paths that the node is joined, as the name suggests. So for example, I can route S1, T1 on this red path, S3, T3 on this green path, and that's it. I cannot route anymore because the routing has to be on this joint path. So in this case, the solution value is two because I routed two pairs. And what I care about is what is the optimal solution value that they denote by opt. This is the largest number of pairs that I can route. So this is the problem, and there is a very closely related problem, a close relative of this problem called edge path problem. It's exactly, everything is exactly the same. You, now you allow the, the paths to share vertices. They have to be disjoint in their edges. So here you'll be able to route all three pairs. So in general, even though it feels like addition path is kind of easier, these two problems, they kind of behave in a similar way. Mostly whatever I'll say about one of them is going to be true about the other. So at the beginning, I'll talk about no addition path problem. I'll switch to addition path at some point just for convenience. So uh, these are very basic graph routing problems. And in theoretical computer science, they have been studied in a very long time. Uh, originally, they were motivated by VLSI design and optical networks. And kind of independently, they were also studied in the graph theory community, in particular in Robertson and Seymour's graph minor series. So if you're not familiar with this, this is a fundamental body of work that spans more than 25 papers and took more than 20 years to complete. And one uh, not insignificant part of this work is actually an algorithm for the no digit path problem. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because routing on digit paths is very basic graph theoretic concept. And also, if you want to figure out, can you embed a small graph into a big one, or is this graph a minor of this graph? It kind of makes sense that you need to solve a routing problem. So at the same time, graph routing problems, they naturally connect to other very basic graph theoretic notions, such as, of course, flows, but also partitioning and cuts in graphs. And often to make progress on them, you kind of need to come up with new insights about graphs. And this often turns out to be useful for many other different areas and problems, and I just list some of them here. So let me go back to the original problem, no digit path problem. So vertices that participate in the demand pairs, I'm going to call them terminals. And to make my life easy, right now I'm going to assume that all demand pairs are disjoint. So we don't share terminals. It really doesn't make, uh, make any difference, it's just going to be easier. So throughout n is, as always, the number of vertices in my graph. k is the number of the demand pairs. So, uh, I come from theoretical computer science, and the question we want to ask in theoretical computer science, can you solve this problem efficiently? So let's start with easy things. What happens if we have just one demand pair? Well, that's easy, just ST connectivity. Yeah, sure, we can solve it efficiently. Good. 
What happens if we have two demand pairs? So somewhat, uh, maybe shockingly, if your graph is directed, it's already an NP-hard problem. So I will only talk about undirected graphs. If your graph is undirected, you can still solve it efficiently. But it's a really neat theorem that comes with it that's very non-trivial, and I find it pretty mind-boggling. So the theorem says this, either you can route your two demand pairs, or if you cannot, your graph is basically planar. And you can draw it in such a way that S1, S2, T1, and T2 appear on the boundary of this planar graph in this circular order. So if you could draw it like that, of course you cannot route them, there is no way. But this theorem is if and only if. Either you can get the routing, or you can get a drawing like that. I find it a very striking statement. And this is just for two demand pairs. Uh, so actually I cheated. It's not planar, it's something called a flat graph. It really doesn't matter, just little technical details. Morally, this is what it says. Okay, and now let's move on to k equals to three uh, and higher values of k. So for that, uh, the work of Robertson and Seymour, as long as k is bounded by constant, gives an efficient algorithm. How efficient? So the running time is n squared times f of k for some large function f of k. <laughs> so th this is actually a vast improvement over the original bound. So in the original bound, uh, the height of this tower was in itself a tower, whose height was in itself a tower, and so it was a constant number of times. Today, the height of this tower is a constant. Uh, <laughs> we are not sure what constant. So I think for addition pass, <laughs> For addition pass, I think it can be like between three and five, I'm not sure. For no addition pass, it's going to be higher. I don't know what it is. So the scenario I'm interested in is the most general one where k can grow with the input size. It can be n over 10 or square root n and things like that, and then the problem is np hard. So here's a really simple example to just put things into perspective. So this is a graph G, and these are two sets of vertices S and T. And I wonder, what is the largest number of disjoint paths I can have connecting S and T, right? Well, this is very simple. You just can cast it as a maximum ST flow problem, so that the flow on every vertex is at most one, find the maximum ST flow, use integrality of flow, get the path. But you have no idea who is going to be connected to who, and you cannot influence it. It will give you some matching. There is no way to do anything about this matching. This is the matching you'll be given. But if I care who gets connected to who, if I want a specific matching, the problem is NP hard, that's the non-digit path problem. Okay, so the problem is NP hard, which means you cannot get an algorithm that solves it efficiently and optimally. Well, we could just give up here and say, you know, sorry, the problem is NP hard. But this is not a very satisfying state of affairs because we do want to solve this problem in practice and we do want to say something useful about it. So we have to compromise on either efficiency or optimality. So in the area of approximation algorithms, we compromise on optimality. So approximation algorithm is efficient algorithm. It will not give you the best possible solution, but it will return you a near optimal solution. So if your solution value is always within factor 10 of the optimal one, that's a factor 10 approximation. So for alpha approximation, always you have to uh, return a solution that's within factor alpha of the optimal. So, um, in the area of approximation algorithms, we really care about these approximation factors to such an extent that we compare algorithms by the approximation factor they achieve. And sometimes things are really good. You can get one plus epsilon approximation for any epsilon, that's excellent. Sometimes you can get a constant approximation, two or three or 10. We also consider it very good. We do care about a specific constant. We do try to optimize it. Normally, you'll end up with a reasonable constant. I don't know of important problem that has 100 approximation and doesn't have like a better approximation. But sometimes you have no choice and you have to get an approximation factor that depends on your graph size, like log n, square root n, things like that. So normally, intuitively for me, you know, when I see a polylog n approximation, it's not ideal, but you can, you can live with it sometimes. When you see like square root n approximation, that's just, you know, forget about it. It just, you know, we don't know what to do about this problem. So, of course, we want to design approximation algorithms with as good approximation factors as possible. We want to get really close to the optimum. But sometimes, you know, you work and work and work and work, and you cannot improve your approximation factor. 
And then you may wonder, maybe it's impossible to do it. And if it's impossible to do it, how can you prove it? So there is actually a really neat technique to prove that you cannot get a better enough approximation. It's called harness approximation. So if I can prove to you that getting a better than factor 10 approximation is in itself an NP-hard problem, then this is it, right? If you could get a better approximation, you could solve the problem exactly. So this is called harness approximation. So in the area of approximation algorithms, we really care to find this exact threshold of approximability of a problem. And it's kind of strange if you think about it because it doesn't have to exist. It's quite possible that up to here you can solve efficiently, starting from here it's NP-hard, and in between it's some intermediate complexity. But for some reason, often we manage to just pinpoint this exact point where you know it's between P and NP. And we kind of intuitively believe it should be there to such an extent that if you have upper and lower bounds that don't match, we consider the problem open and we want to solve it, we want to close it. So this is theory. Um, in practice, the approximation factor of the algorithm does not always reflect how good the algorithm is. Because this is a worst case analysis and because we care about other things, how complicated the algorithm is, running time and so on. But this quest for looking for better and better approximation factors forces us to look for other algorithmic techniques. We want to come up with algorithmic techniques that are more powerful, ideally also simple, to basically increase, improve the algorithmic toolkit that we have, and eventually we hope they will find their way to practice. And now, harness approximation results, they are also very important, and not only because they save you time that you have, would have wasted otherwise trying to get better algorithms, but to prove harness approximation, you really need to understand what is it about this problem that makes it difficult, which is a really cool thing in itself. But also, when you have some real-world problem, there are usually several ways to cast it as an abstract problem. And if you know what is easy and what is hard, it can kind of help you guide the, the modeling. Okay, so we go back to our problem, no addition path problem, and now I want an alpha approximation algorithm. So I want my algorithm to compare really well to the optimal solution, and I want to be able to prove it. But we don't know the optimal solution, right? We actually can't even compute it, that's the whole problem, right? So how can I claim that my algorithm compares really well to the optimal solution? So one method of doing this is I'm going to relax my problem to something easier that I know how to solve, and I'm going to use this easier solution as an estimate on the real optimum. It's got, it sounds like uh, hand wavy, but it's going to be pretty rigorous. So uh, I'm going to use a multi commutative relaxation. So here, instead of connecting SA to TA with one pass, I just want to send flow between them. So it doesn't have to be in jiggle flow. So here is a quick recap of what is a multi commutative flow problem. So we have a graph, you have SA TA pairs, and the way to think about it, you have commodities that you need to ship from different points to different points. So there could be oil that you want to send from oil refinery to a gas station, and there are some cars that you need to move from car factory to a car dealer, and maybe there is produce that you want to send from a farm to a supermarket. So each one of them is not just one truck, it's a whole flow of trucks going and going and going. And you don't need to select just one path for them, you can decide I'm going to send some of them here, some of them here, and so on. So all of these flows, they have to live in your graph simultaneously. You want to maximize the total amount of flow you're sending. And the constraint is that the flow through a vertex is at most one. So for example, here I can send one half flow unit on each of the red, blue, and green paths. This is a good flow at most one flow unit through a pass, and this gives me a flow of value three halves. But this is not the same as solving the digit path problem. If I tried to solve the digit path problem, I would have uh, gotten a solution of value one. So still, the good thing about multi commodity flow is that we can solve it efficiently. For example, by using linear programming. So when I'm going to talk about LP relaxation of this problem, I'm going to talk about this multi commodity flow relaxation. So the solutions to the flow problem, we call them fractional solutions. Solutions uh, to the integral pro problem, we call them integral solutions. And in general, every solution to the Dijon path problem gives you a good flow. So with flow solutions, you only allow more solutions. So because of this, your optimal flow solution can only be better than the optimal integral solution. It cannot be worse. So now if you take a flow solution and you manage to round it, to turn it into integral solution, 
And you don't lose too much flow. You only lose a factor alpha. Uh, and uh, so you retain an alpha fraction of the flow. Then you know this is a factor alpha approximation algorithm. Because if you compare well to the flow solution, surely you have to compare well to the integral solution. Flow solution can only be better, it cannot be worse. So this technique is called LP rounding technique. And I'm going to show you an algorithm that does this, exactly this, for the no-digit pass problem. So it's a really simple, greedy algorithm. I am just looking at the flow currently at my network and take any flow pass that has flow on it. And among all these flow paths, I take the one that's the shortest and add it to my solution. So as I add it to my solution, I need to update the flow so it doesn't conflict with this path. So whatever flow pass shares vertices with my pass, I set the flow on it to zero. And then I keep on going. So really simple greedy algorithm, take the shortest pass in every iteration and update the flow. As you would expect, it doesn't do so well. It gives you a square root n approximation, which is not ideal. But you know, we have a lot more sophisticated techniques for designing approximation algorithms, so shouldn't we be able to do better than that? So it turns out that if you stick to the same technique, if you want to do uh, LP rounding of the multi commutative flow relaxation, then you cannot do any better than this. Let me show you why. It's a really cool and simple example. So you just take a grid. The sources are on the top row of the grid. The destination's on the bottom in the opposite order. So now I'm going to show you a flow solution. Take this red path connecting S1 to T1, send one sort flow unit on it. Take this blue path, one sort flow unit, and so on. So for every demand pair, I'm going to choose a different row and send one sort flow unit through this row. Why one third? So you can check that every vertex will participate in at most three paths. This gives me a good flow solution. The value is k over three. k is roughly square root n. What happens with the integral solution? I can only send one demand pair. Because if I try to connect two, they would have to cross. And this cannot happen here. So this shows me a gap. It's called integrality gap between the best flow and the best integral solution of value square root n. Uh, this integrality gap shows me that there is no way to get a better than square root n approximation if I compare myself to the flow. So intuitively, if you think about the flow as your estimate on your solution value, sometimes this estimate is just too far off. It's so far off that it's not useful. OK, sounds like we should come up with new techniques for this problem. But the really annoying thing about this problem is that we can't really think about any new techniques. Then maybe the problem is hard to approximate. So we only have roughly square root log n harness approximation. So if we could get a polylog approximation for this problem, that would have been really fantastic. So the harness does not rule this out. And we just cannot improve on this really simple algorithm. OK, so you know what? Uh, sounds like we should be looking at some special cases of this problem. Let's check out planar graphs. And you know what? Let's check out grid graphs. So even for grids, we could not beat that square root n approximation algorithm. And at the same time, this hardness result is very complicated and very non-planar. So if you want to look at grids and planar graphs, you only get NP hardness. And it's, it's really ridiculous. I actually don't know about any other problem, which we cannot understand on grids to such a ridiculous extent. So just to make sure we're on the same page, this is how the problem on grids looks like. So you have a grid. You have sources and destinations sitting there. You want to route as many of them as possible by digit pass. So maybe that's a possible solution. So it looks like, you know, to understand the problem better, we should start with grid graphs then progress to planning graphs, and then maybe solve the general problem. So with this plan in mind, together with my students, we improved a little bit the grid graphs, a tiny bit, and even a tinier bit. This is a 90-page paper that a lot of work went to it. Yeah, a little bit better than square root n for planning graphs. But at this point, I was very happy and optimistic because this showed that the multi commodity flow relaxation is not the end of the world. There is a way to get around it. So at this point, I was looking for a polylog for grid graphs and hopefully planning graphs. Unfortunately, after a lot of work, we ended up proving 2 to the square root log n harness approximation, even if your graph is basically grid with holes, if it's a subgraph of a grid. So at this point, there was still a hope that you can still do something in grid graphs, but now there is a new result. So it's still not completely verified, so it's kind of work in progress. 
but uh, it sounds like it's going to be true. Almost polynomial hardness approximation for non digit paths and grid graphs. So uh, the problem is pretty much hopeless. Uh, so let me just quickly mention what we know about adigen paths. It's basically very similar. So this, there is a square root and approximation, a little bit different algorithm, but square root and approximation, the same hardness that we proved for, um, for non digit paths holes here. This time it's in wall graphs with holes. So wall graph looks like this. And it looks like wall graphs for adigen paths, they work in the same way as grid graphs for non digit paths. So if our last result works out, it will also give almost polynomial hardness for this problem on um, wall graphs. Okay, so to summarize, uh, things are kind of very sad. Uh, but this doesn't mean that we should give up, right? So what's the next thing? Uh, well, in many cases, you don't really need the path to be disjoint. It's okay if they share vertices or edges to some tiny extent. So now we can ask, what happens if we allow a little bit of congestion? Or what does it mean? So routing with congestion C means that the same vertex can participate in up to C pass, or the same edge can participate in up to C pass, depending if you're edge pass or not edge pass. So the solution value is still the number of pairs that you route. And historically, we always compared ourselves to optimum that routes all pairs with no congestion. So you could also define as optimum that uh, largest number of pairs you can route with congestion C. And it won't make any difference later, but this is how it was always defined. So this problem also has a really long history, starting from Raghavan and Thompson. So their famous paper on randomized rounding technique for LP rounding, it actually was for this problem. So they showed if you allow the congestion to be almost logarithmic, then you can get a constant approximation in terms of the number of pairs routed. Which is really great, but it's a lot of congestion. We want much smaller. So there was a very, very long line of work here. I don't even list all of it. But today we know that if you just allow congestion 2, you can get a polylog approximation for both adigen pass and non adigen pass. So it's pretty striking. Like, if you want to route on disjoint pass, there is pretty much nothing you can do. But if you just allow condition two, suddenly you get almost reasonable approximation algorithms. So all of these papers, all of them use the same multi-commodity flow relaxation. So for that relaxation, if you route with no congestion, there is square root and integrality gap. If you allow just congestion two, then suddenly things get much better. You can get polylog approximation. <coughs> So this result is almost tight because if you want to improve congestion too, you need to solve the no digit path problem, which we know is uh, kind of impossible. But also this polylog, so there is a ma uh, matching hardness. So there is a hardness approximation result that says that with congestion C, you cannot get better than log to the one over C. So the polylog, the exact the poly in the log is not exactly matching, but we know it should be polylog. We cannot get like a constant here. And uh, the most exciting thing for me is that uh, this work led to some new structural insights into graphs that were actually not known in the graph theory community, and they led some new results in graph theory, and I'm going to talk about them later a little bit. So for now, I'm going to focus on one of these results. So we want to get constant congestion and polylog approximation. And I'm going to switch to addition path problem just because it's more convenient. It really doesn't matter much. So I painted a very sad picture about these problems that you know there is nothing you can do. But actually there are some important special cases on which you can solve both problems really well. And one such ex important special case is expander graphs. So these graphs are very important in theoretical computer science, I guess also in graph theory. So these are graphs that expand really fast. What does it mean? Whenever I partition the vertices of the graph into two subsets, I look at the number of edges going across. It has to be large. It has to be comparable to the number of vertices on the smaller side. So this two here, it's not really important. You can put any constant here or even just no constant. Just the number of edges going across should be at least as large as the number of vertices on the smaller side. So you don't have small cuts. And in expander graphs, suddenly these problems become really easy. And if you have a nice enough expander and you have a bunch of demand pairs, not too many of them, you can actually route all of them on the pass. 
So there is a lot of work here uh, that went into these results, but the bottom line is that on expanders you can do really well. So uh, we would like to exploit it. We would like to use the fact that you can route really well on expanders. Uh, but you know, you can tell me that you know the graph that you're giving to me is not really an expander, so what am I going to do? It can be pretty far from being an expander. So the next thing, I want to find expander-like structure in my graph and exploit it. So in order to tell you exactly what I mean by that, I need to introduce some graph theoretic notion that's very useful in both graph theory and algorithms. It's called well-linkedness. So well-linkedness, it was defined in several different ways by several different communities. So there are several different ways to define it. I'm going to define it in the way that works for me. It's going to be a little different from what you're familiar with from graph theory, maybe. But all these ways are kind of uh, equivalent, so it doesn't really matter. It's just little technicalities. So this is my graph. This is a subset of its vertices. I'm calling them terminals. And these are all the other vertices. So I don't really care about non-terminals. I'm going to ignore them. But what does it mean for the terminals to be well linked in my graph? I want them to be really well connected. So whenever I take all vertices in my graph, partition them into two subsets, I look at the number of edges going across, it should be at least as large as the number of terminals on the smaller side. So this is almost like expansion, right? In expansion, we said this number should be at least as large as the number of vertices on the smaller side. Here I'm ignoring the vertices. The non-terminal vertices is only compared to the terminals. So it's kind of like expansion only with respect to the terminals. And because we have this equivalence between cuts and flows, this is the same as saying, whenever you give me two equal size subsets of the terminals, I should be able to connect them by adjacent paths. I don't know who is going to be connected to who. I'm going to route some matching between vertices on the left and vertices on the right, but it should exist. Because if it doesn't exist, you will find a cut like that. I'm going to come to that later. I, right now, I'm not saying that, not at all. I'm just saying that, you know, this is well in goodness. Okay, so the way I define well linkedness is a little different. So under some other definitions, these paths are going to be no disjoint and not adjoint. This is really a little technicality, so you can move between these different definitions easily. So I will sometimes just assume they're not disjoint, it won't make much difference. Okay. So now we're going back to the addition path problem. And remember, terminals are the vertices that participate in the demand pairs. And I will say that my instance is well linked if the set of the terminals is well linked in my graph. Of course, it's possible that the instance I'm given is not well linked. But there is this really neat theorem that says that if you can get a good approximation for well linked instances, then you're done if you're willing to lose this log square k factor. So what this theorem does, you take any graph, you can cut it into sub-instances, each of which is well-linked, and you will not lose too much flow by doing that. So because of this, if you're willing to lose this log square k factor, you can just focus on well-linked instances, solve them, and you're good. There is a little caveat, your algorithm, this is only true if your algorithm compares to the flow solution, which is what we're going to do in any case, so you can just ignore this, but I just wanted to put it here. Okay, so now uh, I guess to your question. So now I look at the graph, I have the terminals, and they're well linked, right? And well linkedness really reminds me of expansion. And routing on expanders is easy, and I want to exploit it. But of course, even though the vertices are well linked, it doesn't mean that the graph is an expander. It can be very far from being an expander. The intuition is that if these terminals are well linked, there is an expander sitting in that graph, and I want to find that expander and route in it. So what I want to do is embed an expander that's defined over these terminals or their subset into my graph, and then do the routing in the expander. What does this mean? So I'm going to take an expander. It's defined over terminals or a large enough subset of terminals. And every vertex, there's going to be a terminal. I'm going to embed it into something you call a cluster, which is just a connected subgraph of my graph containing that terminal. So this is going to be the embedding of the first one, second one, and so on. So these clusters, they don't need to be disjoint, but every edge should belong to at most two of them, let's say. 
Now, what about the edges? So every edge, I'm going to embed it into some path connecting the two corresponding clusters. And I want embedding with congestion at most two, which means that every edge belongs to at most two clusters or one cluster on one path. So I claim that if I manage to find such an embedding, I will actually be done and pretty easily. Why? Because now I can solve this problem, the routing problem on expander, where I can do really well, even on no digit path. And then I take this solution and I can translate it into the solution in my graph with congestion at most two. So let me show you how. So for example, maybe there is a path here connecting S to T in the expander. Each one of these edges is a path in this graph. So I have this path here. But each one of the blue clusters is a connected subgraph. So I can stitch them together like this. So because of this, whenever I find a bunch of vertex digit paths here, I do a trans translation like that. And now every cluster I'm going to use it at most once. Every red path I'm going to use it at most once. And all together I'll get congestion too. So if you look at this plan, basically two and three are immediate. I mean, two uses some previous work, but they're immediate. The question is, how do we do one? <coughs> Sorry. How do we embed an expander into a graph using wall linkedness? So there is a really neat tool for doing this. Uh, it's called the cut matching game. So I'm going to show it to you. Think about this as just for now, just some abstract game. And then I'm going to show you how to use it to embed an expander into your graph. So what is this game? It's a game that's played between two people, a cut player and a matching player. So we start with a graph that has even number of vertices and no edges at all. We want to turn this graph into expander by gradually adding edges to it. The cat player wants it to happen as soon as possible. The matching player wants to slow it down. And we play this game in rounds. So in the first round, the cat player computes some bipartition of the vertices into two equal size subsets. The matching player has to return a complete matching between the two sides. And we take the edges of the matching and add them to the graph we are building. This finishes the first round. Second round, cut player again computes some bipartition of the vertices into two equal size subsets. Matching player returns some complete matching. Edges of the matching are added to the graph. And I'm going to keep on going until I get an expander. The question is, how long should I go? So Kandika, Ron, Vizirani showed that it doesn't matter what the matching player do, it can do some really bad stuff. After log score and iterations, you will get an expander. Not only that, but there is an algorithm, efficient algorithm, that in every iteration will tell the cut player what to do. So now let's see how this can help me embed an expander into my graph. So this is my graph, these are the terminals, they're well linked. I want to define an expander over the same set of terminals. And I'm going to play the cut matching game. So first the cut player computes a bipartition of the terminals into two subsets of equal size. But the terminals are well linked. So because they are well linked, I can connect terminals on the left to terminals on the right by DGN pass. I have absolutely no control over which matching is going to be routed. I'll get some matching. But I can think about this matching as the response of the matching player. So I'll take the edges of this matching and add them to the graph I'm building. And then I'll just keep on going like that. In the second iteration, there is a different bipartition into two equal size subsets. Again, from well linkedness, I can route them like this. Again, I get some matching, add it there, and so on. So after log square k iterations, I'm guaranteed to get an expander there. But not only that, because of the way I was building it, I will get an embedding of this expander into my graph. How cool is that? So this is really cool, except there is a problem. What's the problem? Huh? No, the matching is easy. You find this, so you get the DGN path, right? Connecting these two sides, you see who gets matched to who, and that's your matching. The problem is different. The problem is that we wanted embedding with congestion two. We wanted every edge to participate in most two paths, right? What do we do here? So in every iteration, the paths are disjoint. But you keep on going log square k steps, right? Every time you compute a flow on the same set of edges. And you may reuse the same age log square k times. That's not good for us. That's like, will not help us at all. 
what would help us if we could somehow partition these edges into different subsets and in every iteration somehow use different edges, that would be perfect. Because we don't want to accumulate this congestion. So this brings me to the next combinatorial object that's called path of subsystem. Again, think of this as some abstract object and I'll connect it to what we're doing later. So path of subsystem has two parameters, length L and width W. So I start with L disjoint clusters. Every cluster is a connected subgraph of my graph. Inside every cluster CI, I have two sets of vertices. I mean, there are many vertices, but these are two special sets of vertices, AI and BI. Each of them has W vertices and they are disjoint. And I require that if I look at the graph induced by the CI, then AI union BI are well linked inside that graph. And finally, every consecutive pair of these clusters, I'm going to connect them by W pass like that. So I'll put W pass connecting B1 to A2, W pass connecting B2 to A3, and so on. So uh, this pass that they use, they have to be disjoint from each other completely and internally disjoint from the clusters. So every pass starts in the cluster, ends in the cluster, does not visit any cluster along the way. Okay, so L, the length, is the number of clusters. W, the width, is the number of paths in each one of these sets. So um, this theorem is very useful. It evolved over a number of papers. And the theorem says that if you have a graph that has k vertices, which are well linked, you can build in this graph a path of set system with lengths and widths that are pretty large, as long as they're not too large compared to k. The tilde here hides poly low k factors. So this 48 here is kind of uh, not, uh, I mean, it's kind of a big constant. Uh, so this is a constructive proof. If you want a non-constructive proof, you can get a little better constants, but yeah, uh, it would be good to get something nicer and cleaner. So let me show you how this theorem can help us with embedding an expander into my graph. So first of all, for us, the parameters that we're going to use, the number of clusters L is going to be log score K. And the width, the number of this pass in every uh, set is going to be K over poly log K. So if you're gonna put them here, it's going to work out. And this theorem also gives us some extras that I didn't mention here. And the extras are that you can take W terminals and connect them to A1 by this joint pass. And these terminals will form demand pairs. So the picture is going to be like that. You have these W terminals, they form demand pairs, they connect to A1 by paths that are disjoint from each other and disjoint from this path of set system. So what I claim is that once we have this, this is it, we can embed an expander into the graph. So let's see how. So first of all, let's look inside some cluster CI. We have these two sets of vertices A and BI and they're well linked inside CI. This means that I can connect AI to BI by disjoint paths like this. Again, I have no control over the specific matching that's going to be uh, routed, it can be anything. So whatever it is, I'm going to rearrange my picture to look nicely like that. And then I can go and do this to each one of the clusters in turn. I'll get W paths that just go and visit each one of the clusters in turn. So now we put back the terminals. And now I want to build an expander here over a large enough subset of terminals and embed it into this graph. So I will not use all the terminals, only those terminals that connect to A1. So I'm going to throw all the other ones out. So there are K over poly log K of them, so that's enough for us. And now I need to tell you how I embed each one of these terminals. I need to embed it into some connected subgraph here that contains the terminal. So it's going to be very simple. I will just embed every terminal into the path containing the terminal. So orange terminal will go to this whole orange path, blue terminal to this whole blue path and so on. So these are the vertices. And now how do I build the edges and how do I embed them? I'm going to play the cut matching game. So in the first iteration, the cut player is going to compute the bipartition of these vertices into two equal size subsets. What I'm going to do, I will go to the first cluster. We look at the vertices on the left and this gives me a bipartition of these vertices into two equal size subsets. Those vertices, this A1, they are well linked inside this cluster. I can connect them by disjoint paths like that. So this black path, they're disjoint from each other, 
but they may intersect this path that embed the terminals, which is why we're going to get congestion too. So I'm going to have some matching routed. I'll treat it as the answer of the matching player, and I'll add these edges here. First iteration ends. Second iteration, I compute another bipartition of the vertices into two equal size subsets. And now I'm going to go to the second cluster. Again, look at the vertices on the left. Again, this gives me a bipartition of these vertices. Again, they are well linked. I can route them by the chain pass, treat it as the answer of the matching player, add these things here. And so I can keep on going like that. I only need log square k iterations. And the number of clusters here is exactly log square k. So in every iteration, I'm going to use a different cluster, and the congestion is not going to accumulate. I'll get embedding with congestion too. So to summarize this par uh, part, if we start with addition pass in the linked instances, we need to find a path of the system in them. I didn't show you how. This is the bulk of the technical work, but we can do it. Once you find it, you can embed the expander into your graph using the cut matching game. It's pretty easy, the way I showed you. Then you use one of the algorithms that we know for routing on expanders. This is given to you as a black box. And finally, whatever you routed in expander, you can translate into routing in your graph, and you're done. You get routing with condition two. But along the way, we also got a structural result. So the result says, if you have k vertices in your graph, which are well linked, you can build this large path of system in your graph. And this structural result turned out to be really useful for a bunch of different uh, things. So I want to mention one of them, the excluded grid theorem. So the excluded grid theorem, it was part of Robertson and Seymour's graph minor series. It's a very important theorem. And it deals with the notion of two widths. So before I continue, I want to tell you, give you some intuition about two widths. So the intuition is like that. So we have these nice, simple graphs called trees. And we really like them because they're usually easy to understand. And for many problems, you can solve them efficiently on trees. And then you have these really complicated graphs that we don't know what to do with them, right? But the feeling is that it shouldn't be, you know, you're either here or here, right? There must be a more graduate transition from left to right. For example, if you take a tree and add two edges to it, it's not like suddenly it becomes so complicated we don't know what to do, right? There must be some way to go slower. And so what we want is that we want some number that will measure how complicated our graph is. And the really cool thing is that tree width does it. Tree width of a graph is a number between one and n minus one, and it tells you how complicated your graph is. So if the tree width is one, your graph is a tree or a forest, and the higher it gets, the more complicated it is. Okay, in what sense? So the way I think about tree width intuitively, and you know, don't tell anybody because it's not really very formal. So intuitively, the way I think about this is that if your graph has tree width k, for many problems, you can get algorithms whose running time is two to the k times polynomial in n. It's not like a promise or a formal statement or anything like that, but mostly this is the feel, what tree k means. Okay, so the way tree is defined is through some tree-like structure that simulates your graph and you look at the width of the structure. I don't want to go into that. You can define it equivalently by looking at well-linked sets of vertices in your graph. So if you look at the largest set of vertices in your graph that's well linked and look at its cardinality, then the cardinality is going to be the same as tree widths under this definition up to factor three. So if you want, you can define tree widths like this. It won't change things much. Okay, so now we have this more nuanced picture. We have trees and low tree widths graphs where things are kind of okay. And then there are these large tree widths graphs that we really don't know what to do with them. So the question is, is there something good we can say about them? And it should be good in the sense that you can use it in many different settings. You want a big hammer that will let you handle these graphs no matter where you are. So Robertson and Seymour's excluded grid theorem does this. It says that if your graph has a large two widths, then something really good happens in this graph. It has to have a large grid as a minor. What does it mean? It means that you can take a large grid embed it into your graph in the same way we embedded expanders into your graph, except that you don't allow any congestion. You cannot have vertices and edges reused. That's what it means. 
So this theorem turns out to be very useful. So forget all about, I complained about grids in the first part of the talk. Grids are actually really good for you uh, because they're kind of easy, except if you try to solve the non in path problem, they're very easy to understand. And there are many things that you can immediately say about your graph just by knowing that it has a large grid in it. For example, right away, you know that your graph has many disjoint cycles because grid has them. That's it, right? You can prove that it has many disjoint cycles of length zero modulo m if m is small enough compared to the grid size. This requires some work. Despite what I said, unless you try to solve the no disjoint path problem, grid is a convenient routing structure. For example, with condition two, routing on a grid is a piece of cake. So you know that you have this large convenient routing structure. You know that the size of the vertex cover in your graph is large by looking at the grid. There is lots of things you can say immediately just by knowing that your graph has a large grid. So this theorem turned out to be very useful. It was used originally also in that algorithm for no digit paths with constant number of demand pairs, but it's also useful in many other different scenarios. So now let's make things a little bit more formal. So if your tree width is k, your graph has to contain a grid minor of size f of k by f of k. So a grid of f of k by f of k is a minor. What we want to know is how large is this f of k? Basically, the bigger the grid is in your graph, the more useful it's going to be for you. Because if you think of this, well, having a tiny grid in your graph it just doesn't say much about your graph. You want it to be big. So the first question is, what is the limit? How far can we even hope to push it? So Robertson and Seymour showed this is not very difficult to show that you cannot hope to get more than square root k by square root log k. And they conjecture that this is the right bound. What do we know on the positive side? So for a long time, there was some work, but basically things were stuck at sub-logarithmic size. So on the negative side, you know you cannot beat square root k. On the positive side, you only have grid minors of size roughly square root log k. And the question is, can we get grid minors whose size is polynomial in k? Or does it have to be polylogarithmic in k, or is it something in between? So building on the work that we did for routing problems, we actually showed that it's polynomial for some very tiny uh, polynomial. Uh, it got improved to a less tiny polynomial, but there, are still, uh, <coughs> there is still a gap between the upper and the lower bound. So by the way, the first proof is completely constructive. The second proof is kind of not very constructive. So let me show you the main idea, and it's very simple. Use the path of subsystem. So it's not very hard to show that if your graph has a large path of subsystem, it has to have a large grid as a minor. So this was noticed independently by Leaf and Seymour and by Chandra Chikur and myself. So if you want grid minor of size g by g, you just need a path of subsystem of length g squared and width g squared. If you think about this intuitively, it kind of makes sense because in path of set system, you have these horizontal paths going across. You can build them, right? You can think of them as the rows of your grid. All you need is to add the columns. And there is so much connectivity inside these clusters, it feels like you should be able to do it. So this requires some work. It's not trivial, but it's not very difficult. And now we're basically done because if we know that your graph has a large two, it's, it has a large set of vertices that are well linked and we know you can build a path of that system, and that's it. You just need to check the parameters. So I feel, in a sense, we kind of came a full circle. So originally, the excluded grid theorem was used by Robertson and Seymour to get this algorithm for not digit path problem. But we used some techniques that we developed for routing problems in order to get better bounds for the excluded grid theorem. And let me say a very quick historical note. So it looks like things are so simple. We just took it and plugged it in, and it just worked. So this is not how things really happened. So for routing problems, we defined a much weaker structure that was called a tree of set system. And then we realized that for, not, for exclude grid theorem, we need this stronger structure of a path of set system. So this still required quite a bit of work, but we had a very good starting point. We are like almost halfway there when we started. And later, once we uh, were able to construct the path of set system, we went back to the routing problems and we realized that things become much simpler, cleaner, and you can do more there. So this path of set system seems to be really useful. So I have been working for quite a few years on routing problems. And I find these connections to graph theory and fixed parameter adjustability, which I didn't uh, mention, to be very exciting. And I feel there should be more interaction and back and forth between these areas. 
And for many years, I thought of myself as working on approximation algorithms and hardest approximation. So I find it very useful to look at the same problem from these two very different angles. Because sometimes you really believe you should be getting an algorithm, but you should really be getting a hardness result, as we saw with knowledge and paths in grids. So it's good to study the same problem from these two very diff uh, different angles. But now I feel there is a third angle, which is graph theory. And I find it very exciting to see the interaction between these three areas, and I hope it will continue. Um, finally, let me mention some open problems. So it would be really good to close the gap for the excluded grid theorem to get tight bounds. It's, it would be really interesting. No decision pass with small number of demand pairs. Like if you have three or four demand pairs, you have to go through Robertson and Seymour's work. And it's basically hundreds of pages. And it just doesn't make sense that when you have three demand pairs, you cannot do something simpler and cleaner. And finally, so this problem, I didn't mention it. It's, I think, uh, from approximation viewpoint, uh, the most important uh, open problem that was left in this area, congestion minimization. So here, you want to route all demand pairs. You want to minimize the congestion. So what I mentioned, Raghavan and Thompson randomized rounding technique will give you log n divided by log log n approximation algorithm. We don't have anything better even for planning graphs. Uh, we have log log and harness approximation that don't work in planning graphs. And even the integrality gap of the flow LP, you know, the gap between integral and fractional solution, we don't know what it is. It's between log n over log log n and log log n lower bound. For planning graphs, the lower, uh, lower bound doesn't work. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? So for this um, no disjoint path problem with constant k, the bottleneck in, in Robertson and Seymour's work seems to be looking at when you have a unique solution and then showing that the tree width is bounded. Do you the unique linkage theorem. Part of the problem. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I looked at the unique linkage theorem. I tried to simplify it for adjacent paths. At some point, I thought I had something, and it was just too long to write. <laughs> and no adjacent paths, I don't even know how it works. So, <laughs> okay. but it's a good question. Like for three demand pairs, I didn't try to do it. Yeah. So, uh, one second. One second. The cut and the matching game, which you define, with the cut player chooses a certain cut and you said the cut player always wins or you get an expander after so many rounds so what if the cut player chooses the cut randomly no, no, no. Oh, i'm sorry so, so the claim was that there is a strategy for the right, cut right. player so yeah. random doesn't work unfortunately so, so random doesn't work no so we don't know anything about like if, even if you do randomly no randomly i think you can show that it doesn't work okay. it has to be tail so, so the way I think more or less you look at the current graph, you look what is the worst cut, and more or less that's the cut that you return. Random is not going to work. But yeah, I, I didn't work on that stuff. I just know that it, it doesn't work. Any further questions? I've got one question. I'm not sure if it's implicit in what you've said, but if I have the problem of given a graph and I ask what's the largest grid minor that it contains, can you say anything about that, approximation-wise or otherwise? Um, yeah, I'll need to think. I mean, the question is whether harness, I mean, <laughs> I'm not very optimistic you'll get good uh, algorithms. I think at some point I thought about getting largest click minor and we couldn't say anything useful about that. I don't know about uh, grid minor. Uh, all right, so uh, before we thank the speaker again, I'll just mention, as always, there is a reception just across the hall right now, and I will <coughs> present a gift from the CNI oh, department you. to thank Julia for that lovely talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, this one. Thank you.